Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this York Festival of Ideas event. My name is Victoria Hoyle, and I am the director of the Institute for the Public Understanding of the Past at the University of York, and I will be chairing this evening's event. A few technical notes before we begin. If you're watching live, then you can ask questions using the Q&A button, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. This is available throughout the event, so please do ask questions at any time. Questions which are for our speaker will be saved until after the talk has finished. Should you have any technical issues this evening, such as loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded and you will be able to watch it again later via our YouTube channel. Subtitles are available for the event, so to turn those on or off, you can use the CC live transcript button, which again is found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It gives me great pleasure then to now introduce our speaker for this evening, Catherine Harkup. Catherine is a chemist and author. She completed her doctorate on her favourite chemicals, phosphines, and went on to further doctoral study uh, before realising that talking, writing and demonstrating science uh, appealed more than hours standing over a hot fume hood. Catherine is now a science communicator giving regular public talks on the disgusting and dangerous side of science. I'm delighted to welcome Catherine to talk this evening about her absolutely fascinating book, Death by Shakespeare, Snake Bites, Stabbing, Stabbings and Broken Hearts, in which she explores how realistic the dozens of different ways Shakespeare killed off his characters actually are. I can't wait to hear more about that. So without further ado, Catherine, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be back at York uh, talking about all sorts of sciencey things and also some historical things. So this evening I'm going to be talking about death by Shakespeare. And Shakespeare, of course, was writing his plays for a very different audience. He was writing 400 years ago and he was writing for London theatre goers. And yet his plays are still shown, re uh, reimagined, reinvigorated, 400 years later. So something must have been uh, written so well, done so beautifully that uh, it has survived the passage of time. Now, one of the main features of a Shakespeare play is the extraordinary number of characters that meet their demise on and off stage. Uh, you might think that Shakespeare was a little bit bloody, uh, but if you compare him to his contemporaries, he was actually quite mild, I would say. There were far worse, uh, far more um, bloodthirsty playwrights out there. Having said that, um, Shakespeare was giving his audience what they wanted. So what exactly was this audience expecting? Well, as I say, he was writing 400 years ago for a London audience, and London was very different back then. It was roughly two miles across and a mile from north to south. So a relatively small city, and packed into that very small space were 200,000 people. And they were not in high-rise uh, flats and tower blocks. They were mostly in a few story buildings, but packed very, very close. There were also a lot of people uh, bringing in trade from abroad. There was a, it was a busy port, so they brought in all sorts of goods, people and diseases from far-flung places um, around the world. And some of the diseases that uh, grew up in London itself were exported out around the globe. There were lots of things going on in London. It was the third biggest city in Europe in its day. And all of these people packed together. It is the perfect way to spread and encourage the spread of those diseases, because the one thing that London lacked was sewers. So it is not surprising that there were quite a few people who were ill or caught some nasty disease. And there were all sorts of people you could contact to diagnose your disease. There was a whole plethora of health service uh, available. There were physicians who were very knowledgeable. They'd been to Oxford or Cambridge, they've got a degree, and they were very, very expensive. And then there were cheaper options uh, further down the line. There were apothecaries, there were midwives, and then of course there was the wise woman down the road who could give you uh, the benefit of her experience. 
all of these people featured in Shakespeare's plays in flattering and unflattering roles. I would be very dubious of an apothecary in a Shakespeare play. They are usually up to no good. However, all of this diagnosing uh, was done very haphazardly. There were no stethoscopes. There was no sophisticated analysis of blood. There was analysis of urine, but it mostly amounted to checking the colour, sniffing it and maybe tasting it to see if you had diabetes. So diagnosis, not very good. Uh, prescriptions and treatment also not very good. You would do very well in Shakespeare's day to listen to his advice and throw physic to the dogs, because without an understanding of bacteria and the fundamental causes of disease, there was very little you could do to treat them. So it was more by luck than judgment that uh, people got better. There were also no hospitals to treat, well, there were three hospitals in London to treat people. Uh, these hospitals were reserved for the poor. Most people who went into them did not expect to leave. And it was a way of keeping all of the very unwell poor people away from the well rich people. Most people would have been nursed at home. And they might have called in experts who would do home visits, but most of the nursing would have been done by friends and family. So disease, birth and death was very much a public event. Uh, your friends and family would come round to see you in your last moments, comfort you and wish you on your journey. So the vast majority of people in Shakespeare's day would have seen death up close and personal. If they were lucky enough to escape death on the personal level, if their family was particularly healthy or managed to avoid the many horrible diseases that were going about, they could always get their fill of dead bodies out on the streets of London. Because pretty much every crime uh, was considered a felony. Only the most trivial of thefts was uh, considered a misdemeanor. And if you committed a felony, that meant you could be sentenced to death. The death penalty was imposed for an extraordinary range of crimes, although it wasn't always imposed. There was leniency within the legal system. However, executions were sentenced and they were carried out in public, particularly hangings. You could go along to Newgate and you could, it was a very theatrical event. There were crowds that would gather, there would be speeches, there would be people selling food, there would be prayers. And then of course, there would be the event itself. And you could stand there and watch as the person twitched and their last and hung around until their fingers and their their belly blackened as the blood sank to their extremities to confirm that they were dead. This was considered entertainment. If there wasn't a hanging on the particular day that you wanted to see one, well, then you could go around and you could see an alternative site because there were other creative ways of executing the populace. You could, for example, wander the streets in search of one of these. This is a gibbeted uh, felon. Gibbeting was reserved for particularly harsh, uh, severe crimes, uh, murder, the planned murder, particularly grievous robberies. And the sentence was that you would not be hanged, you would not be killed, but you will be bound up in these iron hoops and your body would be taken or you would be taken to the scene of your crime and you would be hung up from a post and left there to starve. If you were lucky, you would probably dehydrate in a couple of days, weather dependent. If it rained, if it was cooler, you probably lasted a bit longer. Your body would then be left up there until it disintegrated as a warning to everybody else in the vicinity not to repeat the crimes committed by this particular person. I don't know how effective that was. If there were no gibbeted individuals, if they'd collapsed and disintegrated to the point where they weren't really fun to look at, you could always go out to Wapping, which was uh, further east of London. And it was a tourist attraction because at Wapping, that was where they killed pirates. They executed pirates. And a specific form of execution for pirates was to be hanged at low tide and allowed to be washed by the waters three times. So plenty of opportunity to see dead bodies in and around the environs of London. So in the morning, you might catch 
um, a hanging, or if you were really lucky, a beheading, if you were really, really lucky, a hanging, drawing and quartering. But of course, you might want something else to do in the afternoon. So most Londoners, they went to the South Bank for their entertainment. So most people lived on the north side of the river, and then they went down to the south side. Because so if I take away the north side, now we've just got the south side of the river. The only way to get to the south side, apart from a boat across the River Thames, was the one and only bridge that existed, and that was London Bridge. And you would walk across London Bridge, and at the end of it, you see there in the corner in red, you would go under the Great Stone Gate. And the Great Stone Gate was where they displayed the decapitated heads of treasonous individuals. So you could have a look up, see if there was anyone famous, anyone you knew, uh, see if there were any new additions or if any had disappeared because they'd become too rotted and they'd been tipped over the side into the Thames before you carried on to the pleasures of the South Bank, which included parks and gardens, pubs, inns, brothels, bear baiting, and of course, playhouses. This is where, just here, this is Shakespeare's Globe Theatre, a very special theatre, not just because it was Shakespeare's home, but also because it was the only theatre in London, and there were an increasing number around this time, it was the only theatre that was devoted exclusively to plays. Now, of course, Shakespeare needed to draw his audience in, so what do you do when you can see hangings, pirates and beheadings for free? Well, you give your audience lots and lots of death because that's what they want. You have, yeah, you would charge a penny to get into this building, which wasn't very much. It was about the cost of a loaf of bread. But as I say, public executions were free to watch any time. You could just look at the Great Stone Gate whenever you felt like it. So lots of heads are brought on stage, lots of hands are lopped off, eyes are gouged. There's a lot, a lot of stabbing on stage. This is what the audience wanted. I really don't think you could have shocked an Elizabethan audience with whatever you presented to them in any play. So this evening, I'm going to go through just a few of the more well-known plays and try and figure out what Shakespeare was trying to do. Was he trying to show a realistic depiction uh, or was he just trying to entertain his crowd? Did it have to be realistic considering they all would have seen the realities of many of these injuries for themselves? Who knows? We will see if we can figure it out. So. We'll see how we how many deaths we get through. If I miss out your favourite death, I apologise. There simply wasn't time, but do pop a question about it into the Q&A and I will do my best to answer at the end. If any questions occur to you as we go along, then uh, by all means, drop them in the Q&A and we'll get to them at, you know, at the end. So... The title of the book is Death by Shakespeare, Snake Bites, Stabbings and Broken Hearts. So let's start off with snake bites, because why not? So snake bites, one of the most famous deaths, not just in a Shakespeare play, but one of the most famous deaths, full stop, is that of Cleopatra, the Egyptian ruler uh, from centuries and centuries ago. If you haven't read the play, if you haven't seen a production of it, I'll give you a basic outline of what is going on. Cleopatra loves Antony. Antony loves Cleopatra. Cleopatra hears that Antony has died. In fact, he stabbed himself because he thought Cleopatra was dead and he does a terrible job of it. So he lingers on for a few more, well, another scene. He drags himself to Cleopatra's bed and then he dies. She is devastated. So she decides to kill herself. Now, Cleopatra had done some planning for this eventuality. It is said that she was a great scientist. She enjoyed investigating different poisons and potions because she was interested in a death that was painless and would keep her looking fairly attractive post-mortem. Why not? Most of us would want a painless death. I'm not so sure we care so much how we look afterwards because we are, after all, dead. But it was apparently important to Cleopatra. So apparently what she did was she lined up all of her servants or, or not her servants, all of her 
all of the criminals that have been condemned to death in her uh, regime. And she tested different poisons on them to see the effects. It's a very scientific method. It's, uh, I'm sure she didn't have to worry about ethics committees or anything like that because it is truly horrendous. She tried all sorts of, of toxic compounds and venoms on various different uh, criminals. She decided, for reasons I don't really understand, that the bite of a snake would bring on a slow lethargy. This appeared to her to be a very gradual and a very uh, pain-free death. And this is the death that Shakespeare portrays on stage. So we are told that she, uh, she smuggles or has smuggled into her room an asp. Now, Shakespeare knew many things about many different subjects, Snakes is not one of them. Uh, if you read enough Shakespeare, you'll soon realise that he hadn't got a clue how snakes really worked at all. He thought the tongue was the poisonous bit. He thought they were slimy. He also called every snake, regardless of what it was, an asp. However, we can probably guess what type of snake really did kill Cleopatra, because it was likely be this guy, the Egyptian cobra. So the Egyptian cobra, this is native to Egypt, hence the name Egyptian cobra. It is also the snake that is associated with the ancient Egyptian diadems and all of the religious and uh, uh, pharaoh's paraphernalia. So this symbol of this snake would have been part of uh, Cleopatra's decoration. So it's a good guess as the kind of snake that she might have known about. It is also a good choice because the Egyptian cobra is very, very toxic. Its bite can deliver enough venom to kill an adult as long as the snake itself is quite big and quite uh, mature. So you're looking at a snake that's about one to one and a half metres. I would suggest that's quite difficult to smuggle in in a basket of figs, but it doesn't really matter because it's theatre and it, it's all for the drama of the moment. So Cleopatra takes this snake, having decided that it's going to give her her pain-free death, and she clutches it to her breast and to her arm, and the snake bites. She chokes out a couple of lines, and she collapses on her imperial bed, just with her diadem askew, and she just gets tidied up a little bit, and that's the end of Cleopatra. All very swift and uh, sensible. Unfortunately, that's probably not what would happen if you were bitten by this particular snake, because this snake, all snakes contain a multitude of different compounds in their venom. It is not just one thing. There's a whole mix of stuff in there. There are two main categories of compounds in this particular mix. The first category of compound are neurotoxins or toxins for nerves. This means that the bite of this particular snake is very, very painful because it's activating those nerves. It's also disrupting how they function. So you do indeed get this creeping paralysis, which is what Cleopatra may be observed. But it will hurt like hell as it progresses. Uh, what eventually kills you is that the muscles uh, that control your breathing, the nerves that signal for those muscles to work become paralyzed and you suffocate. So you suffer from respiratory collapse, all very unpleasant. And it takes more than a couple of lines of dialogue. This, this is agonizing for a while. The other category of poisons that there are within this venom are cytotoxins. And cytotoxins are toxic to cells. They literally cause the cells to destroy themselves. So this means that you are going to get blistering and bruising around the site of the bite because of the damage to the tissues. So Cleopatra is going to need some cosmetic touches to kind of tidy herself up or type be tidied up. Now, this kind of damage to the skin is noted in the play because after Cleopatra is dead and quite a few other people along the way, a whole host of people rush into her rooms and they examine the body and they describe something blown and they identify the bite on the arm and on the breast. So there's something of a forensic examination. It's a little bit like you would expect to see in a modern detective drama where the scenes of crime and all of those people in the white suits are uh, collecting evidence and examining the body to determine the cause of death. 
So they determine that it is a snake bite. And because of this damage to the tissues, and they say that there's also a slimy trail of uh, snake slime that they can follow. So that wouldn't happen either, but they figure it out. Now, if you're thinking of doing away with yourself, please don't. Please stay with us. Uh, please definitely don't choose the snake bite. It's going to be agony. It's also difficult to get hold of the snakes. I would also, if you're absolutely hell-bent on choosing this method of dispatching yourself, I would also question the wisdom of allowing the snake to bite your breast and your arm. There are less painful areas of your body. So there was a wonderful scientific uh, research <laughs> carried out by a guy called Michael Smith, and he decided that he would wake up each morning and he would get five honeybees and he would allow the bees to sting him on different parts of his anatomy and rate how painful it was out of 10. Now, this is sound theory because although we can have a very good map of where all our nerves lead to in our body, actually how we perceive pain might be very different because pain is very much uh, not just the nerves firing, but it's how we interpret it and how those signals are transmitted. So of all the places to test and of all the places to be bitten, what, was decided, what Michael Smith decided was that the least painful place to be bitten is the toe or the skull, so on the top of the head. That he rated 2.3 out of 10. A bite on the nipple, he, or a sting on the nipple, he rated at 6.7, but at least Cleopatra didn't go for the most painful part of the body, which Michael Smith says was the nostril. And it's a good choice. It wouldn't look good on stage. And actually, it doesn't matter whether all of the details around Cleopatra's death are accurate because it looks fantastic on stage. And his audience was there to be entertained and see a great spectacle. There was even some doubt when, she, when Cleopatra died as to the actual method or cause of her death. So the snake bite theory is the most common, but there was also discussion because she was so well versed in all of these different poisons and venoms. There was a theory that, in fact, she had a hollow needle or kind of hairpin. And inside the hollow of this hairpin, there was a toxic substance. So she would wear the hairpin in her headdress. And when it came to the appropriate moment, she pulled it out and she stabbed herself with it, uh, administering the content into her body. So there was lots of discussions of, about variability at the time, and Shakespeare just took the most dramatic and put it on stage because that was his business. So if you have any questions about Cleopatra, by all means, uh, pop them in the chat. But I am going to go on to the next part, and I'm going to talk about stabbings. So there is a fantastic pie chart of all of the deaths in a Shakespeare play, all divided up and represented by the different coloured wedges in this pie chart. And the biggest wedge by far is stabbings. There are a lot of stabbings on stage. And that is for the simple reason that swords were a very common uh, itemed for adults to be carrying around with them. And people were quite tense in the Elizabethan era for various reasons, and so sword fights were quite common. When actors fought on stage, they fought with real swords. And to make sure that these actors weren't harmed or to minimise the chances of harm to these actors, the actors trained at a fencing school on Blackfriars, which is just the other side of the river from Shakespeare's Globe. So people would be watching the dis these fights that occurred on stage with a near expert eye. And some of the actors, they were considered masters of fence. Some of the other playhouses, when they didn't have a play on, they just had uh, fencing demonstrations because that would also draw a crowd. So this was a very, very big part of a play. There's one play, Henry the uh, Henry the Sixth, Part One, that I think includes 22 sword fights. So he's very much uh, Shakespeare is very much giving his audience what it wanted. So there's all kinds of reference in in various plays 
to uh, the subtleties of fencing and the detail and the technique. But of course, some of these fights have to go wrong because you have to have your character stabbed like Mercutio or Paris. Um, and so learning to fence properly was important so that swords could be safely slipped under arms or um, just dodged out of the way so that you didn't actually harm the actors. Sometimes, however, uh, it, they took it to excess. So how do you portray a stabbing realistically on stage? Because Shakespeare's Globe, there is no curtain that can drop down. You can have lots and lots of blood that the audience absolutely would have loved to see, but you have no opportunity to mop it up in between scenes. So if you have a lot of blood on stage in the middle of your play, you're going to have your actors slipping and sliding for the rest of the play, and that is not good. So also the most important part, the most valuable part of uh, Shakespeare's acting theatre company was not the actors. You could damage a few actors along the way. That wasn't terribly important. What was really important was the costumes. These were incredibly elaborate, incredibly expensive, detailed, handmade costumes. And you didn't want to get blood out of them because the blood would stain. And if you washed, kept washing these uh, garments, they would just disintegrate. They would look terrible. So blood had to be very, very carefully controlled. So let's talk about one of the bloodiest scenes in a play and how Shakespeare, because he's so brilliant, he could engineer it all so that... Uh, none of the blood would get on the costumes. So I'm going to talk about the assassination of Julius Caesar. I'm pretty sure this role went to an actor that nobody really liked because this actor, they get to say that they are the title character, but they are killed off halfway through the play and have to sit out the rest of it backstage. However, the death itself they get stabbed 33 times. Now, obviously, Julius Caesar is a historical figure and we know he was stabbed to death. But according to the historical record, he was stabbed to death only, uh, or he received only 22. Can everyone still hear me? Because my computer is having a moment. So... Julius Caesar was stabbed 23 times in real life, but 33 times on stage. So how do you control, because that's a lot of blood. So it's very easy to have all of your actors, all of your conspirators surround Julius Caesar and they can uh, pull out daggers and you can see them move towards Julius Caesar and you can see Julius Caesar collapse on the stage and everyone kind of knows what's gone on. Then you can get a sheet that's already been stained with blood and you can just put it over the body, as you can see in this particular picture of reproduction here. So this um, is all fairly straightforward. However, there is a line in the play that instructs the actors to dip their hands in Caesar's blood uh, up to the elbows. So we get to see lots of blood, but it's in a very, very specific place on the actor's body. So that means that it's kept away from the costumes itself. But what would you actually use for this blood? Because there are lots of options. Today we have fake blood that is uh, very good and it's very easy to wash out of the costumes. But what were they using 400 years ago? Well, fortunately, there are an awful lot of uh, descriptions in plays and some of the technicality, the stage directions and the detail of productions that have survived uh, from all of those centuries ago. Some of them mention things like red wine. So red wine certainly has a very intense colour and it would look fantastic in a puddle on stage, but it doesn't really stick to the skin very well. So it wouldn't look very good smeared on the hands and the lower arms of the actors in Julius Caesar. An alternative might be something with a bit of a stronger pigment. And there was certainly that around. So there's this stuff, which is called cinnabar. 
So cinnabar is a mercury sulfur compound, very uh, well known, and a very, very intense red, almost a bright, bright red, too bright to be really convincing as blood, but it would certainly stand out on stage and the audience would get the idea of what was going on. But of course, this is Shakespearean England and there's an awful lot of blood around. So why not just use the real stuff? There were, after all, abattoirs just around the corner. So it'd be perfectly possible just to go to an abattoir and ask to see some of the or us to borrow, have some of the blood from the animals. And incredibly, they were really, really specific about what animals they should take the blood from. So they're absolutely adamant that you should not use calf's blood because calf's blood was too thick. What I think they actually meant by that was that it coagulated too quickly. Obviously, blood coagulates, it forms a kind of jellied mess or a hard crust, and then is to stop, you know, to prevent uh, worse injury, to stop us leaking our vital blood all over the place, and to protect the body from bacteria that might try to make its way in and infect us. So blood clotting is extremely important. It's just not very desirable when you want liquid blood for your play. So what the playwright specified was that you always used sheep's blood. Always, always, because sheep's blood remained liquid for the longest. So you could get a bladder of sheep's blood that you could pierce at the appropriate moment and get your blood on the right bits of your actor's body. So that's how you might control the blood on stage. However, there is then the problem that once you've got the blood all over you, that's very easy to do. You then have to wash it all off for, before the next scene. So Shakespeare being the brilliant technician that he is, he is able to uh, give lines to his actors. He clears most of them off stage. He leaves two talking for about 53 lines while the others clean themselves up. And then they swap over. Another two come out and carry on their conversation for another 50 odd lines. So those two actors can go off stage and clean themselves up. It is a brilliant orchestration of how you get your actors on and off stage without having to drop a curtain or without having wings that they can just disappear off to very, very easily. So Shakespeare is a brilliant technician. And he also, the use of blood, it, not just in protecting the clothes, but distributing it on the hands and on the arms, you, are, you literally show the guilt of the people who stabbed Julius Caesar. They are left literally bloody handed. So that's Julius Caesar. Now, of course, the last part of the title is Broken Hearts. Now, can you really die of a broken heart? Well, possibly. It certainly uh, seems to be a common enough problem in Shakespeare's day that you would have uh, various characters who have very, very sad events in their lives and they suddenly just drop dead through sheer grief. One, of course, is Lady Capulet. So she is so upset that her son Romeo has been banished from the city for killing someone in a duel that she literally dies of grief. And it's one line in the play uh, her husband says, my wife has died of grief, and that's it. We just move on. Apparently, that's just a thing, and we just deal with it, and we don't worry about it. Incredibly, this could possibly be a thing that would happen. So, for example, um, there is a condition called broken heart syndrome, and this happens to people who are going through extreme emotional stress. So, for example, a bereavement or a serious accident, uh, debt or whatever. So something that is seriously affecting their mental health can also have an effect on their body and specifically the heart. So it can cause a problem with the ventricle of the heart. So the ventricle, um, the base of the heart, what happens is, is that it balloons out. Rather than contracting and pushing the blood around the body, it just balloons, which means you're not getting efficient movement of the blood around the body. So you will feel very, very unwell. Now, most people, they recover from this without even any treatment. It's just a spontaneous thing that they get better. So 
with reasonable rest and care, they will do just fine. It's not something to worry about. However, Shakespeare's day, perhaps the rest and care wasn't up to the same standards that it would be today. Who knows? So maybe Lady Capulet's death is more credible than perhaps it first appears. Of course, the really heartbreaking story within Romeo and Juliet, the play, is the death of the title characters, Romeo and Juliet. So these star-crossed lovers, they have been uh, separated uh, after their secret marriage, and they Juliet is being promised to be married again to someone she doesn't want to marry, but also she's already married, so it would be bigamy. So she hatches this brilliant plan. With the help of a friar, she will take a potion that makes her appear dead. She will basically fake her death so that she will be taken to the, her family tomb and then her love can sneak back and Romeo can rescue her and they can live happily ever after. But of course, this is not a Shakespeare comedy, so no one is going to get to live happily ever after. It is a tragedy. So letters get mislaid. They don't arrive at uh, to tell Romeo what is really going on. But the question is, could you actually fake your death in this way? Is there a potion that could make you appear dead for 42 hours, according to this friar? And then you just apparently wake up and you are perfectly fine with no lingering after effects. Well, you sort of can. There is a poison that will do that. And that poison is called tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin is the poison that is in the skin and some of the organs of the pufferfish. Now, this particular poison, what it does is it affects your nerves. So your nerves that run along throughout your body, sending messages, they send little electrical signals along the length of the nerve, and then that gets passed on to the next nerve or the muscle or wherever. These electrical signals are generated by two metals, sodium and potassium. Potassium is inside the cell and sodium is held outside the cell. And when the nerve fires, the atoms, these, these potassium and sodium swap places and that generates the little electrical signal that passes on the message. What tetrodotoxin does is it blocks the sodium from moving. So, well, it doesn't stop it from moving. It, keeps the sodium channels open the whole time so the nerve cannot reset itself. It's like trying to fill a bath when the plug's undone, because normally after your nerve fires, all of those uh, potassium and sodium atoms that are in the wrong place, they get pumped back to their original positions. But you can't really do that if your sodium channels are always open because they're always just leaking back into the nerve cell. So what happens if you eat tetrodotoxin or puffer fish contaminated with tetrodotoxin is that your nerves don't fire. So you get a kind of flaccid paralysis. You go all floppy. You're horribly awake through all of this because it doesn't affect the nerves of the brain quite in the same way. But it means that you cannot signal your distress. You cannot tell people, I think I've eaten tetrodotoxin because you can't move your hand, you can't move your mouth, and eventually you can't move your lungs. because, And so you end up suffocating. Pufferfish is a very popular food in Japan, prepared as sushi, a, a sushi dish called fugu. And the best sushi apparently has just enough tetrodotoxin to make your lips and your tongue tingle. Now, obviously, there are accidents and um, the Japanese are very good at treating people with tetrodotoxin. There is no antidote. What you do is you get rushed to hospital and put on a machine that will breathe for you whilst your body clears the tetrodotoxin um, out of its system. In the past, before such technology was available, if someone was suspected of being poisoned or by tetrodotoxin and they couldn't tell uh, if they were dead or not, because if you get the dose just right, you could have such shallow breathing that you couldn't really detect it. And your pulse would be so faint that you couldn't really feel it uh, through the wrist or the artery in the, in the neck. 
So you would appear dead because you wouldn't be moving. And so these people in Japan would be laid out next to their coffin just in case they later revived. And you basically waited until the body was rotting before you put it in the coffin and buried it. So tetrodotoxin would certainly give a convincing appearance of death, especially before the days of being able to use machines to analyze breathing and stethoscopes to look for heartbeat. So it was very much more difficult to monitor these basic bodily signals back in the day. And perhaps you could make uh, mistakes. So if you got the dose just right, it might be possible that Juliet could appear dead for 42 hours and then wake up again. The problem is that Shakespeare had no idea that pufferfish existed because they weren't known to Europeans. It is certainly possible that maybe he heard stories uh, that have been passed uh, through traders who went to the Far East or exchanged goods with traders from the Far East, and they heard stories of a poison that could make you appear dead. Because it is a very common theme, not just in Shakespeare's version of Romeo and Juliet, but in all the versions of Romeo and Juliet that went before him. There are the belief seems to have been quite common that there could be a poison that could be modified in some way to make it less toxic or less uh, deadly. And that's certainly something we do today as uh, modern scientists. We take drugs and we tinker with their chemical structure to eliminate uh, side effects, to make them more potent in treating a particular disease and to make them less toxic to the body. It's just that Maybe uh, the idea was there long ago, just the practicalities of doing it was not possible. So I think we are about uh, at the end of the talk. If you have any questions about any of the poisons that I've mentioned, by all means, uh, pop them in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we do already have quite a number of questions actually already in the Q&A. Um, so we'll jump straight in um, with Sifa's question, which is, what is your favourite death across all of the plays? Favourite death? Oh, that's such a difficult one. Um... I'm going to go for a really obscure, so it will change depending on what day and what time of day you ask me and what play I've just been thinking about. But I'm going to pick a really obscure one because I'm going to pick, um, I have sympathy for the actor who has to portray this role. So I'm going to pick Enna Barbus, who is in Antony Cleopatra, and Enna Barbus just dies. There is no cause, he just falls over, apparently from shame. Um, yeah, I don't even know how you do that on stage. I hope it's fun to do. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't seem like much of a role to me. Poor old Enna Barbus. Well, Sifa says that um, there's his uh, exit pursued by a bear. Oh, um, yes. And we have another question. We didn't quite get there. <laughs> yeah, we have another question about the bear uh, okay. from Catherine, who says, rumour has it that a bear was borrowed from a nearby bear baiting for this part of A Winter's Tale. Is that true? It's certainly possible. There were certainly bears in London and they were, some of them were really famous. The most famous of these bears, obviously, is Sackerson, who gets a mention in The Merry Wives of Windsor. Uh, some of these bears, after they'd done their bear baiting or their dancing on the street, they'd be taken down the pub for a pint and, you know, they were famous. So I think the idea of borrowing a bear might have been popular. However, I wouldn't want to be the actor on stage with a bear that has been baited and then let loose. So I think it's a great idea, but in practical terms, I think um, the actors would have been against it and they would probably be all in favour of putting on a bear costume and being the bear. I agree. I think um, being chased by an actual bear sounds Terrifying. very dangerous. <laughs> um, uh, we have a question about... Um, the sort of the, the the public perception of violence that you were talking about right at the very start of the talk. Um, so the question I ask says, Saints' Lives offered those who could read, hear um, a rich array of grisly stories about outrageous deaths and torture and torment. Do you think those played any part in public perceptions of violence? Very much so. 
Uh, yeah, it, we do. And I don't think that has particularly changed in modern society. Look at the popularity of murder mysteries and, you know, grisly deaths on in fiction now, the popularity of crime fiction, the fact that news items, they always talk about, you know, sudden deaths, tragic deaths, accidental deaths, um, murders, etc. That is a big chunk of our daily lives that gets discussed. The only difference I think we have today is that what we see is sanitized. So we might hear about accidents on the news, but all we see is the police tape across the scene of the crime. We don't actually see the bodies. We might see the twisted wreckage of a, a car accident, but we know that the people that were involved in that car accident are either already in hospital or they, they've certainly been removed from the scene. So we don't actually Actually see it up close and personal but I don't think our fascination has gone away but yeah all of these stories I think and this all of that would have fed into the mentality that uh, Shakespeare was trying to appeal to. We have a really interesting question here from Casey who asks do you think that Shakespeare handled women's deaths differently than men's? Um, I mean, there's a suggestion that um, snake bikes, stabbings and drownings are perhaps not as gory as others. Do you think that? Do you think that men's deaths are gorier than women's? I think he was, I think there is a difference between deaths of male and female characters in Shakespeare plays, but I think it probably reflected the reality. Men were more likely to go to war. Men carried swords, not women. Uh, men were more likely to be convicted of serious crimes and end up being executed. The deaths uh, that women experienced, maybe not snake bites, I, I think that's unlikely, but certainly drowning apparently was the most common method of suicide at the time. And there was a, a drowning very close to Stratford um, just before Shakespeare's time. And his father might have been involved in the sort of coroner's decision around that death. And it's incredibly similar to that of Ophelia in Hamlet. So I think, it, yes, they are different, but I think for very practical reasons that uh, the sort of grisly deaths wouldn't apply necessarily to women, but there are plenty of them. Julia ends up stabbing herself in the chest. Uh, look at the death of Lucretia, uh, Shakespeare's uh, epic poem. There are plenty of grisly deaths, just not as common for women. Mm. Speaking of grisly deaths, someone has said um, there is some doubt over the authorship of Titus Andronicus because of the number of violent deaths featured. Why do you think the violence was toned down in later plays? I don't know if it was toned down. It's pretty grim in all of them. Titus Andronicus is certainly the bloodiest of the plays. And if it was co-written, I think it was co-written with uh, Fletcher, possibly, who might have influenced the, the bloody nature of it. Um, I don't know. Maybe it just wasn't Shakespeare's thing. Maybe he's quite happy to have some sword fights, a few, you know, fake heads on sticks. But actually, it didn't interest him he was more interested in human character rather than you know and for example the death of Ophelia the death of Ophelia is tragic but it's tragic because of the people who are left behind and who are dealing with her death um so I think it's just a different attitude to his characters and the sort of plays that he was writing yeah, that, that makes an enormous amount of sense. I don't um, think it was necessarily you know, a squeamishness on his yeah. part. Is there any truth to the poison in the ear method of killing Hamlet's father? Um, if I was going to kill someone, which obviously I'm not going to do because I'm a nice person, I would not choose the ear as a, a route of administration. I would advise against it if you're trying to poison someone. It seems like a bad choice. There's a lot of wax. There's a lot of cartilage. It's very difficult for that poison to be absorbed into the bloodstream and into the body proper to take its effect. So um, bad idea, I would say. There are certainly a lot of candidate poison reasons that match up with some of the symptom, symptoms that old Hamlet describes that he suffers. But Shakespeare rarely 
writes a line that is straightforward. It's always got about half a dozen meanings, if not more. So there are allusions to not just an actual physical poison, but the poison of suggestion and corrupting um, maybe Old Hamlet's mental state, but also some of the descriptions of the effects on the body are like syphilis. So maybe they're talking about a uh, sexually transmitted disease that Claudius gave to uh, Hamlet's wife when he was having an affair with her and that passed on to old Hamlet and killed him. So there are many, many ways of interpreting that particular section. But as a straightforward means of murder, don't go for the ear. Understood. We'll bear that in mind. Also, Um, even better, please don't kill people. No. That should be a warning generally across the whole of this this talk. Um, So we have a question now that Um, would have also been my question if I had been asking questions, um, which is, do you have any thoughts on Desdemona's death and the possibility of that? Desdemona's death is really interesting. So um, absolutely wronged by Othello. So he thinks she's had uh, an affair and he rushes into her bedroom and he smothers her. It's not really very specific in the text what goes on, but the idea is that she's smothered, strangled in some way. And then Othello kind of realises the awful thing that he's done. And then Desdemona wakes up long enough to say he done it so that everyone knows. And then she dies again, which is very convenient for the plot. However, I think it's possible. So you could certainly smother someone or maybe strangle someone to the point of unconsciousness. And if she's fighting back, which I hope she would because she's a a strong lady, um, maybe in the struggle she banged her head or something. And the injury, her head injury later caused, you know, it caused a bleed into her brain that later suddenly causes her collapse. I think it's possible to work out a logical sequence of events, but it's not necessarily specified in the text. Um, Does it really matter? I don't know. Thank you. That's that's something that has always puzzled me, is what's happening there at the very end. Um, So we're We have a question now on one of the um, less well-known plays, one that I am certainly much less familiar with. Um, What do you think of the deaths in Cymbeline? Cymbeline. Okay, there's um, there's a few beheadings. There's a few attempted poisonings in Cymbeline. Uh, there's a grief death. So this idea of faking a death, um, it's not just in Romeo and Juliet. It is also in Cymbeline. So we have another poisonous monarch, uh, the queen, who wants to do away with uh, Imogen, this um, the daughter of the king. So it's a, a new marriage and she doesn't like the daughter from the previous relationship. And she's doing all sorts of weird experiments and showing a frankly unhealthy interest in chemistry. Not that I think an interest in chemistry is unhealthy, but her particular focus is unhealthy. So her doctor, who she's been asking advice from, does the sensible thing. And when she asks about poisonous substances, he substitutes things that are less poisonous and will give the appearance of death rather than killing. So for the sort of reasons that I described for Juliet, that's sort of a possibility, but sort of not. Uh, Some of the other deaths, um, the broken heart, yes, certainly, or the grief. Um, Decapitation, that will work, definitely. Uh, I can't remember any other deaths from Cymbeline. I'm struggling. It's not one I'm that familiar with. I apologise. I know, I feel like we're really testing you tonight. We've not <laughs> question about the same play so far. And here's another one. Okay. Um, so in, in Much Ado About Nothing, um, yes. would it have been possible for Hero to faint so hard that she's presumed dead? And are there any cases of, of something like that? Uh, yes, I think so. I th- think the idea of heightened emotion, she's just been accused of terrible, terrible things by her father. And so she faints clear away. And I think, you know, if you if it's extreme if you have they don't really examine her body it's just an assumption oh she's just dead and so the father leaves and then thankfully hero revives and she can now play on the fact that she's 
been written off as dead and she can actually use that situation to her advantage. So certainly the idea that, you know, heightened emotion can cause you to faint, that is not controversial at all. Look at all those fans fainting when they see their idol on stage at a, a big pop venue or on the red carpet. That's not unusual at all. So, yeah, I think it's credible. The fact that uh, it would be believed as a death so quickly, maybe that's stretching things, but it's a play. Yeah, I feel like it's a little bit of a, a dereliction of parental duty to just accept as read that She's gone. Yeah, I, he's almost <laughs> like, oh, yeah, she's a terrible, terrible human being. Now she's dead. Great. We'll just draw a line under that one. And yeah, let's, let's, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, another uh, question about um, the a cause of death. Um, so Steph is asking about Lady Macbeth um, mm -hmm. and whether or not you think uh, that she dies of uh, extreme insomnia caused by guilt. Um, I'm not sure it is possible to die of a lack of sleep. I am in no way suggesting that anyone should try and find out. Uh, there have been experiments where people have gone for an extraordinarily long time without sleep and they have survived with no physical damage. However, during that period of insomnia, they do some very, very strange things. They hallucinate, they become very aggressive, they are not in control of their emotions. So if you couple that with the extreme stress of just inciting your husband to kill pretty much everyone, um, I think you could be in a mental state that is not uh, 100%. So I, I think it's a, probably a contributing factor to her death, but actually a cause of death, no. We have two questions, one from Francis um, and one from Sally, uh, both asking about how many actors were either fatally, fatally wounded or badly wounded by mistake um, on stage during any of these death scenes. There are a couple. Um, there's certainly, there's, um, now let me think, there was a famous case in Shakespeare's Blackfriars Theatre, so this was his indoor theatre uh, on the north of the river, uh, the sort of winter venue for his acting company, and it was a very uh, packed stage, it is a, a stage as we would understand it today, but people were allowed to sit on the stage to watch the action up close. And sometimes they got too close. So there was one guy who uh, was sitting on stage during a sword fight and one of the actors was a little bit too exuberant and he was cut in the face. So uh, accidents like that, I imagine, were fairly common. Uh, there were certainly fights between actors off stage, uh, various rivalries, egos, bit of alcohol probably contributed to things. So also between playwrights and actors, Ben Johnson spent an awful lot of time in prison for getting involved in duels that ended up with people dying. So I, I think uh, being a playwright and being an actor was probably quite a hazardous profession. Uh, and it wasn't just the swords that you had to worry about. There's one play, it wasn't Shakespeare's company, but uh, there was a moment in a play where one of the actors was tied to one of the pillars on stage and had a musket pointed at him. And for reasons best known to the actors involved, that musket was loaded. And when it was fired, it fortunately missed the actor, but it killed a member of the audience. So it wasn't just the people on stage that were at risk. It was the audience members, too, because health and safety seemed to have been barely acknowledged um, back in the day. That sounds absolutely terrifying. Um, Catherine, we have just lost your video. Um, I don't know if you can reinstate us. Ah, I'm not sure that I can. Let me see. My computer is absolutely not having it today, and I don't know don't why. Don't worry. Don't worry at all. We're, we've got time for just one more question, okay. um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, it's another gory question uh, about Excellent. performance. Um, so uh, Laura asks, how would the eye gouging in King Lear have been performed? <laughs> uh, well, today, I believe they use lychees. 
because you, know, you just turn your actor away from the main audience and you kind of position your other actors so that you can't really see what's going on. And then you produce a couple of lychees because they're about the right size, right colour and texture for eyeballs. Mm -hmm. 400 years ago, I imagine you just went to the local abattoir and asked for a couple of eyeballs. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> What a delightful thought. Um, what a wonderful note to end on. Um, we've had a comment in, in the, um, the Q&A from Jim who asked, the most important question is, after this wonderfully graphic talk, how does the audience ensure that they have a nightmare-free sleep tonight? Um, and I think that is a question for us all. Um, Catherine, thank you so much for thank a you. wonderful, enlightening, fun um, and gory um, talk this evening. Um, for all of those who are still with us, um, please do remember that the recording of this event will be available via the Festival YouTube channel um, after um, the 24th of June. And you can access that through the Watch Again section of the Festival website um, or just uh, by clicking on the link that will be emailed to you. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of Catherine's book, uh, which I assure you is fantastic, um, then it is available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Um, for more information, you can again see the festival website or indeed uh, link directly to Fox Lane Books. I believe that there's just been a link put in the chat for that. We hope very much that you've enjoyed this evening and that you will continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. Please do uh, look ahead to the events which is still to happen um, and come back after the 24th of June to catch up on any that you have missed. Um, you can also chat about the events on social media using the hashtag uh, York Ideas. So all that remains is for me to once again thank Catherine very much um, for a brilliant uh, session. Um, I wish you all good evening. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>